One thing you all learn very quickly is there's manners and rules. And if you follow these manners and rules inside of these these things, um, it's it's things go well. And I really respected the administrators. And there's always a greeter. And the greeter is up at the – when you first come into the world, there's a greeter. There's always somebody there. And they're very helpful, real kind. And they set you up right away, and they're very serious about following the rules and procedures. And I understand why. Because it's not going to be an educational place. It's not going to be a really place for the imagination if you just get a bunch of people in there uh, yelling and screaming and running everywhere and just killing each other. Uh, and so one of the rules you learn very quickly is you can't just go around shooting people and shooting innocent children and animals. Um, there's all different types of role play in here. You can be an animal, but then you can't be smarter than a human if you're an animal. So it's all about the imagination. Um, somebody that I was being trained with by one of the administrators, she wanted to be a fox. Uh, from And you have to be a fox from Arizona. You have to be one of the animals that are actually from the Arizona Territory. So everything is very controlled. And uh, But it's a great – that's why – that's what makes this good. And so I hope as I explore more of these worlds, they're of this kind of quality. neat things is when you get a weapon, you can use commands to go prone and sprone if you buy the weapons that are sold by them. And the weapons are about anywhere from about 500 linden to uh, 1,500, even up to 3,000 linden for the weapons inside of the world. Shotguns, cannons, pistols. And the HUD is um, 10 linden to get into this particular world, and so not not very expensive. Uh, one of the ladies that I was going through with, the, the training with, she, uh, she didn't come in with any linden, so I was able to slide her 10 linden over, and very nice. One of the administrators of the group gave me the 10 linden back. And that's the other thing. It, it takes, I, I, I could tell right away, this takes a lot of help and support. And everybody in this particular world, just very, very nice, kind, and supportive. This is actually a screenshot of myself going through some of the training uh, with, uh, I just took some screenshot. Notice with the HUD, when you get this HUD, you'll have a life meter up there with the hearts, and then you'll have, it'll show you how many weapons. And what happens is in this world, if you get killed, or if you get shot and wounded, you have 30 minutes to get either to a veterinarian or a doctor's office. And then there's things in there that allow you to heal yourself. Now, if you get totally killed, you cannot come back for two hours. That, that's it. So after two hours, you can come back in world. Again, in the screen flow. This is the primary this is the primary interface of ScreenFlow. I don't know how many of you used it. Very easy to use. ScreenFlow is about 99 bucks. Um, but very powerful. If you ever use Camtasia Studio, also, also very powerful on the PC side. I think Camtasia actually does run on the Mac side now. But um, ScreenFlow is very simple to use. Basically hit record, set up your input devices, and record away. Some of the most, some of the interesting features about ScreenFlow is, uh, you, of course, you can also do callouts and zooms, and you can have text, and it's all right there on that right menu. And then you have your timeline, and then your main screen where you can actually see your recordings. Yeah, I think that the uh, the realism with the social attitudes and the ability to actually have a world in which you're really supposed to use your imagination to put yourself into that time, I think that's what's so compelling uh, about this. Really, the last thing that um, I wanted to share with you is how I'm going to share this, uh, which is going to be on the Internet Archive. And it's internetarchive.org. I don't know if you've ever used this, but basically this is just a, a, a repository of human information. Um, and anything and everything can go in there. If it represents humanity in some way, uh, it can go into the Internet Archive. And I eventually want to make, um, because to me, I see the potential of particularly educational anthropologists 1,500 years from now, 2,000 years from now, 10,000 years from now, exploring the things that we did with digital worlds. And I want these, um, these machinima 
stories that are created that I'm working with to go into a place where where somebody in the future could dig through and see what we were doing to uh, impact pedagogy and enhance teaching and learning. And um, y'all, you know, that's that's really all I have to share. Um, so I was hoping there'd be time for some discussions and um, possibly a way uh, if you have some feedback from me and have some other uh, role play type worlds to share with me. I'd love to uh, know where the coordinates of those so I can explore them. Oh yeah, no, no problem with the presentation problems and stuff. I was glad that everybody um, was glad. I had several, uh, especially uh, Diantha, really really helped me out, and I appreciate all that. Yeah, I teach in the um, Education Media Design Technology Master of Science program here at Full Sail, and uh, yeah, Blue Barker. I, I'm not for sure about the prismatic. I just couldn't get it to res on the stage. Does anybody have any, um, any any worlds that they could share with me, particularly related to um, history or social studies? Virtual pioneers. Um, I think I've seen something about virtual pioneers. Um, is there are there some landmark coordinates you could give me for virtual pioneers? Let me actually look real quick in my inventory because I think I have that one. There was a poster session on virtual pioneers uh, in this one, and I, I actually do have the virtual pioneers meeting landmark. If anybody wants that, I could share that with you. Let me copy the slurl. Yeah, it's on Edge of Island. One hundred one seventy-one twenty-two. There's there's the coordinates for um, Edge of Island Nine Virtual Pioneers. I, I'm just now getting uh, getting to know this group. Um, screen flow with Windows. I'm still not certain that screen flow will work with Windows. I think that screen flow is still Mac only, but I think Camtasia is a hybrid now. That will Camtasia will run on um, Camtasia will run on Mac and PCs now. But yeah, screen flow is still Mac only. I'll tell you, I. One one thing that I've I've really struggled with though is you know sometimes learning the Second Life interface can be a little bit complex and confusing at first and there's an awful lot of things to to understand about the user interface of of Second Life. I don't know how y'all some of you have dealt with that when you've tried to use it with learners for some way. I used to do all my virtual office hours at Full Sail and um, I, I would. Sometimes I would get, you know, really poor critiques from students be, just because of to discuss things. So I, I eventually stopped using Second Life as a way to host virtual office hour. And we used to use Wimba in the not so recent past. Screen Screencast-O-Matic, what is that? Is that another, is that another um, screencasting platform?
Oh, great. I, f I found the... I found the URL to Screencast-O-Matic. That looks great. I've, I've never never heard of that. Windows or Mac. No install for free. Any of you use Screencast-O-Matic? Jamestown build. I did see that Jamestown build. Uh, I was there I was there recently. Yeah, it's with the... Um, they're associated with ISTE. Yeah, Tech in Virginia. Society of Technology and Education, yes. Ran across them two weeks ago. I found it very interesting how quickly networks happen inside Second Life. As soon as you join one group, you'll quickly get networked into another, or you can talk to somebody, and uh, they'll network you into another group. I was really pleased with how supportive all these networks and groups were, uh, including this conference. Uh, I was... Just so it was very easy. I had a lot of trouble this morning. Um, I actually had a, a complete crash, a kernel panic crash on my Mac several times. My video card's going out. So I actually had to borrow a Mac to, to be able to do this uh, the past two days and to come in here. And, uh, but, it's, but it's been worth it. And uh, I've, learned, um, I've learned a lot. Uh, even just making a build and putting the textures into the into the viewer. That was something I didn't really even know how to do until today. I want to I want to start with the homeschoolers, um, but I think well, I think ultimately I think at risk children, particularly high school, at risk would be my target audience. Um, I find that they're they are the ones that really have no interest, and they see no interest in sometimes in human in the humanities in general, and particularly in hist for studying history. And I think this would be a great platform uh, as a motivation and engagement platform to engage really non-motivated learners in um, researching and exploring more. Particularly if you could pull them into role play. And it's the Second Life tour group, and some of the tours may not be young. Yeah, yeah. That's one thing I, I found too. Um, I, I, I'm kind of intrigued. How do some of you deal with if you're working with younger learners? Do you even bring them into Second Life at all? Most of you work with, um, you know, or most of your learners over the age of 18. Yeah, that, that, that's what I'm finding also. I mean, the adult worlds are just too extreme in Second Life. And, you know, if you were to sign children up with adult accounts, you, you know, you immediately could expose them to extremely mature content. So that really doesn't work, trying to bypass that. Um, I really...